live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. From 1977 to 1993, for over a decade and a half, you knew that the regular season to the college football season was wrapping up and was drawing to a close when this game was played. Because either on the final week of November or the first week of December, the regular season ended with two teams playing overseas and playing a game in Tokyo, Japan, playing what was known as the Mirage Bowl from 1977 to 85 and what was known as the Coca-Cola Classic from 1986 until the game's conclusion in 1993. Not to be confused with the drink of the same name. Someone really didn't think that went through, having two products with the same name. Anyways, there were some fairly memorable moments throughout the history of this game. You have the 1986 installment, where an unranked Stanford team shocked the number 12 ranked Arizona Wildcats. You have the 1988 installment, where Barry Sanders was named the Heisman winner nine hours before kickoff and then proceeded to run for 332 yards and four touchdowns in a 45-42 victory over Texas Tech. And you have the 1993 installment, where in a top 25 matchup, Wisconsin defeated Michigan State to win the Big Ten regular season title and clinched the conference's bid in the Rose Bowl. Safe to say, even though it is no longer around and hasn't been for just about 30 years, this annual Japanese game was highly memorable and has moments that still live on in college football history to this very day. But that doesn't mean that the game wasn't surrounded by controversy from time to time. Absolutely not. Because while the 1989 installment of the game featured a battle between Syracuse and Louisville, it was not supposed to be that way at all. Initially, the game was supposed to feature this team right here, the Kansas State Wildcats. Kansas State was gearing up and ready to go play in this game, and exposed their players to some culture while doing so. And then, because of something completely out of their control, and despite doing absolutely nothing wrong, they were uninvited from the game, and were no longer able to participate. And to say that there was drama from this would be a massive understatement, to the point where litigation was threatened, and where the relationship between the game organizers and the school soured tremendously. Because this is the story behind the bizarre controversy between Kansas State and Japan. Before I talk about the actual game in question that was supposed to happen, and then got cancelled on relatively short notice, all things considered, we need some context to understand how Kansas State was playing, because it will help us to understand, at least to some extent, the hesitancy on the part of the game organizers. And to be very blunt, Kansas State flat out sucked. On October 18, 1986, Kansas State hosted Kansas in their in-state rivalry game, and the Wildcats won 29-12. It was now the end of the 1988 season, and since that game, Kansas State had yet to win another game in any competition. What you're watching right now are just some of the many, and I truly mean the many lowlights during this absurd winless streak of theirs where from the end of 1986 until the end of 1988, they went winless in 27 straight games, including an 0-11 season in 1988 and an 0-10-1 season in 1987, where one of the losses was a guarantee game against Austin P, a Division I AA team in the Ohio Valley Conference who finished the season in every other game with a 1-9 record. With the third worst defense in all of Division I-A, allowing 40.7 points per game, and a bottom 10 offense averaging just 15.5 points per game, meaning that they were outscored each game on average by over 25 points per game, or four possessions, Kansas State was the worst team in all Division 1A. There was no doubt about it. They were terrible no matter how you want to slice it, and seeing how bad Kansas State was in the 1980s makes you truly appreciate what Bill Snyder was able to do with that program when he took it over in 1989. Because there's a reason that so many hold that man in high regards as one of the greatest college football coaches of all time. However, despite the absolutely abysmal performance by Kansas State, they were asked by the organizers of the Coca-Cola Classic if they would be willing to play a game in Japan for the 1989 season. 
how the game worked was like this, since it was technically not a neutral site game. The organizers of the game would try and find a team that usually didn't sell out all of their games, or would be looking to get some exposure, and see if they would be willing to play one of their home games in Japan against a bigger opponent. And in this case, Kansas State seemed like the perfect fit, seeing as of their 11 games slated for the 1989 season, 7 of them were home, and Kansas State didn't really want to play 7 home games, because aside from the fact that they knew they wouldn't be able to fill the stadium, or generate any sort of profit from that, it would mean needing to raise the ticket prices, which is absolutely horrible optics when you're on a 27-game winless streak. Imagine if the Magic Kingdom at Disney World decided to close down Space Mountain, Big Thunder Mountain, Splash Mountain, and all of Fantasyland and Adventureland, and then jacked up the ticket prices to the park. That's what playing seven home games and needing to raise the tickets would have felt like. So when the game organizers approached Kansas State, to see if they would be willing to move one of their home games to Japan, Kansas State jumped at the opportunity. It would mean double the potential revenue for that game. It would mean a great way to get recruits, saying that they would be able to visit Japan and play on national television. It would be great for international exposure. And it would give the players something to look forward to, since this is somewhat of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. As Bob Kraus, the vice president for Kansas State, said on all of this, this should be an exceptionally good experience for our university. It will help from a revenue standpoint, be special for our alumni, and will be a bowl game for our team, which should help in recruiting. And as Assistant Athletic Director Jim Epps said, we feel the pluses of a trip like this far outweigh the minuses. The way they explain it, it's an extravaganza. That raises the question, who would Kansas State be playing in this game? Who would the marquee opponent be that they would be facing in Tokyo instead of in Manhattan? Enter the Oklahoma Sooners. This was who the game organizers really wanted. According to Joe Kawahata, one of the promoters for the game, they actually approached Oklahoma first. But while Oklahoma was interested in playing in Japan, they only wanted to do so if they didn't have to give up a home game. So they went to Kansas State as a way to lure Oklahoma. And there's no denying that Oklahoma was one of the bigger teams and draws to bring over to a Japanese audience. From 1985 to 1987, they ended each of those three seasons with a top three finish, including a national championship in 1985, following a 25-10 win over Penn State in the Orange Bowl. And in that three-year stretch, they won 21-0 in conference play and 33-3 overall, winning a whopping 92% of their games. If you were going to get a team with a large alumni base, and with prestige, Oklahoma was the team to get for sure. Yes, it was Kansas State giving up the home game, but Oklahoma was the draw. And everyone knew that a game between these two schools was going to be a mismatch of ever proportions. This game was announced in July of 1988, and three months later, on October 15th, the two teams met, and Oklahoma won 70-24. But the game organizers didn't care. None of this was surprising to them. They just cared that they got Oklahoma. They wanted Oklahoma, and they got Oklahoma. And this meant that everything was going according to plan for the 1989 game, right? Well, not quite. Because in December of 1988, Oklahoma was put on a three-year probation by the NCAA, and received a really stiff penalty as a result. As part of this probation for committing 20 recruiting violations in an eight-year stretch, and not exercising appropriate institutional control, Oklahoma could not play in any bowl games in 1989 or 1990, and most importantly for the purposes of the story, could not play in any live televised games. This didn't mean that Oklahoma couldn't be on television if the game was tape delayed. If theoretically, Oklahoma played a game at 12 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, a station could show that game at 9 o'clock at night. Nothing was stopping them but live games were completely off the table. And just like that, the appeal of getting Oklahoma was gone. There was no point in getting the Sooners if the game couldn't be televised live for obvious reasons. People generally don't like watching sporting events on tape delay, and don't like watching games where they know the outcome in advance. The ratings would go down the drain. And usually with this game in Japan, 
The game took place at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time on Saturday night, taking place on Sunday afternoon in Japan. So when the heck are you going to play this game on tape delay? When everyone knows the result through newspapers and shows and ESPN bottom lines and 1-900 numbers, where you would get good enough ratings and you would have enough people who genuinely did not know the result. You can't do it early Sunday morning. The West Coast is asleep. You can't do it Sunday afternoon or Sunday night. The NFL is on. You can't do it on a Monday or a Tuesday afternoon. People are working. You can't do it on a Monday night because people will watch Monday Night Football and they will watch a live NFL game over a taped college game that took place 48 hours ago any day of the week. This means that the earliest that you could realistically televise this game was Tuesday night, 72 hours after the fact. I mean, forget about it by that point. So the game organizers, unsurprisingly, called the game off on Oklahoma's end, seeing as it couldn't be on live TV, and there was likely something in the contract regarding live TV rights that gave them an easy out. But here's where the drama and the controversy come in. Kansas State still really wanted to play in the game. They did nothing wrong, obviously. They were the ones giving up a home game. They were the ones bending over backwards to get this game to take place. They based their budget for the year on the added revenue that this game would bring. Their entire pricing plan and recruiting pitch was based on playing in this game. And they wanted to do everything in their power to still play, even if it couldn't be against Oklahoma. They started contacting other schools on their schedule to see if they would be willing to take Oklahoma's spot, and even made a tentative deal to get Colorado to play in the game. And do you want to know what the game organizers told Kansas State? They told them to shove it. They said, pretty much, that Kansas State absolutely stinks. That the only reason they got them in the first place was because it was a means to get Oklahoma. And that if Oklahoma couldn't be in the game, then too bad. Even despite their best efforts, Kansas State was all out of luck. And to say that Kansas State was furious about this would be a massive understatement. Because athletic director Steve Miller just went on a giant rant about how the Japanese were screwing over the Wildcats. As Miller said, the Japanese who we were dealing with do not appear to be very flexible. They have been very rigid in their communication with us and in working out other arrangements. That bothers me, because this would have been a great opportunity educationally. It would have been a natural fit to play another opponent, like Colorado. But the game officials didn't want to hear about it. Things got so heated that Kansas State threatened legal action to force the game organizers to take them since they were not at fault, and they didn't violate any of the terms of their agreement. But this lawsuit went nowhere. As Bill Snyder said afterwards on this whole ordeal, we went through some litigation, and they basically said, if you want to sue, then sue. Do whatever you want, but we're going to go get someone else to play. Translation, the game organizers couldn't care less, and there was nothing that Kansas State could do to change their mind. With that, the 1989 Coca-Cola Classic was not between Kansas State and Oklahoma, and instead was between Syracuse and Louisville. And even though Kansas State got to play in the game three years later, eventually getting that Japanese trip by playing Nebraska in a 38-24 loss, the bitterness and the sting from what happened in 1989 still lingered pretty heavily. The contract information from this game is not available but it would be absolutely fascinating to see just what the language in that contract was, and whether the bull organizers planned for something like this, almost like how a bunch of companies were scrambling once they realized in the wake of the pandemic that they did not have a force majeure clause. Kansas State was being punished for something that they obviously did not do, and were completely being used by the game organizers, who were unwilling to accommodate them, even when they were the only reason that this game was happening in the first place and even when they tried to find a replacement team and make things work. Because even though Kansas State had a 27-game winless streak after the 1988 season, they ended the year with a 28-straight opponent that they were unable to defeat. And that opponent was a group of game organizers over 6,000 miles and half a world away. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. 
Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.